Good morning, TDI, and welcome to the United Initiative. Uh, oh, first, thank God, breaking the mold, inspiring stories of two women who hacked their way to cybersecurity non technical backgrounds. We have with us this morning. Uh, Marin Vernon and Kenzie Wartenberger, who's rapidly on her way into this room, so you may see the speakers. And she may come barely in here. And they'll be able to tell us their stories of how they got into this space. And there will be room for questions at the end. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors for helping us put on this lovely event. And Marin, are you ready? Yeah, I just want to say um, thank you all for being here, for coming to listen to our stories. We hope that there's some great takeaways. As you can see, I'm by myself. That was unplanned due to flight delays. So my co-speaker may come barely in here at any point in time. We hope to be able to let you hear stories from both of us. If not, I don't want to be speaking to her story because she really does it fast. We'll both be available for questions if you hang around after. Um, in the meantime, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do it when I can by myself. So please forgive me because I have to now pick up the other half of the talk, so I'll be sitting on my little walker and talker, but we're gonna get through it together. So welcome to Breaking the Mold, the story of how two non-technical women hacked their way into technical cyber careers. Those two women are myself, Carol Vernon, I'm currently a senior application security architect, and Mackenzie, aka Mac Wartenberger, associate security architect. I myself have been in the industry for just over four years now, four years ago as a completely non-technical person. And Mac, about when we applied for this talk, was close to her six-month marker. Now she's closer to the nine-month marker. So she's been here almost a full year herself. And we are both working as technical architects in a cloud capacity. Uh, we both, oh, sorry, we both do work for Acquia. Um, Acquia Incorporated, securing the digital transformation. We work as a center for Medicare and Medicaid services. So we're a subcontractor for CMS, as you'll hear. So why do we want to give this talk today? Why it's so important to us? Is because many of us are non-technical already when we many women are non-technical already when we arrive at the point in life where we're looking at a technical career or we're looking to make a big career pivot. And that is because we have the interest and the passion for technical careers growing out of us sometimes from an early age. We get suggested to other things that are less technical and less difficult. Um, additionally, there's a lot of false, misleading, and confusing information out there. When I first started, I thought to be good at my job as a professor, I needed to be an expert in Java. Literally, so I was like Googling, how do I learn Java? And God, how misguided was that? So there's just so much misinformation that's not true. You can target the skills that you specifically need to get started, and you can make yourself an expert in them very quickly to ramp up very quickly like I did. Additionally, there are so few successful examples out there to emulate, and we want you to know that we both were able to do it in the kind of career progress you can expect to see six months and four years in. Because sometimes it takes knowing that someone who was in your position came and did it first for you to know that it's possible to do it after. Why we also wanted to give this talk today, let these numbers sink in. This has been the state of cyber diversity for the last two years. We pulled these numbers from a report in 2021, and they're still mostly the same thing. There's maybe a 1% difference in a few of them. 24% female, 9% persons of color, that's all persons of color, and only 2% LGBTQ uh, IA plus members. So we are really hoping that with the takeaways from this talk, more minorities, more women, more diverse people will want to come and join us here and be inspired to try technical careers in this field. And that more hiring orgs will see that they need to open themselves up to that non-technical, that atypical talent, and see the potential and see the transferable skills in order to get better diversity of thought and approach and creativity on their team because that's the only way cyber will innovate and move forward. All right, then hit me with the hard stuff. So, speaking of diversity, back when I started in tech, there were no big pushes for diversity. You didn't see the outcries on social media. You didn't see large de and I committees. You didn't see uh, a lot of that stuff happening, but still I wanted to be here. Still I knew it would be a tough uphill battle and I was determined to make it work. Um, so a very high level overview of my career, and I'm going to go into this a lot more in depth in the later slides. Um, so I basically got my first cyber position ever, actually in a guard unit. I enlisted in the guard, and I grew up in West GRC. That was my first private cyber position that I ever held. Basically one of the most administrative functions you can have working in cybersecurity. And I got exposed to a lot of controls, and there are people with opposite attacks. I'm like, why do we protect against this thing? Because this is the thing we're trying to prevent from happening. I'm like, oh, that's how that works. It's all coming full circle now. And then eventually, I got really good at my uh, GRC job, and I started taking on other responsibilities. And eventually, 
Again, completely unqualified for my job, talked my way into a pen tester role, having no pen testing skills. And that was because I leveraged what I already knew about my role. I already knew about the department, its strategy, its tools, its people. And I said, listen, you already know that when I showed up here four months ago, I didn't know my job. Look at what you've got today. So you know if you give me this job, I'm not going to be the same pen tester today as I am going to be next month. Uh, and that was enough for them. They were like, yes, we will leave you. And here it goes. Um, so as I started pen testing, I realized that the kind of the life cycle of offensive ops was a little broken, especially for a very small security department like mine. I worked on a department of five people. So I was a pen tester. We had a CISO, who I'm counting, uh, an InfoSec program manager, an architect, and an intern. <laughs> so I was like realizing that the more I tried to contribute to my role, um, the less change I was actually affecting. And I had to figure out how to make that work by myself, how to actually contribute change to my work by myself. And I started purple teaming all by myself, which is why I call myself the one woman purple team. So from there, I went from GRC to non-qualified pen tester, spent two years as a pen tester, started building purple team skills, and eventually got my way onto a proper red team in a uh, higher echelon of offensive security called red teaming, working at Zoom. And I was there as well, continued to build enterprise purple teams alongside my red team duties until eventually uh, purple teaming became a dedicated niche of in and of itself. And that's what I do today, I'm an enterprise purple teamer. And alongside that, the entire time I was continuing to build my personal and professional brand on social media, you'll come to learn why that's such a big part of my journey in later slides. Mackenzie is not here yet, but she's going to talk a lot to us about how she used to be a collegiate athletics coach. And she also one day looked and said, I'm just burnt out on my, uh, on my industry, I'm burnt out on this field, I want to try something completely different. She got the golden nugget to try cyber one day, um, and she tells the story so much better, so I hope she gets her to do it. Um, but she actually found someone who was head of his own cyber company, the company that we both work for, and they decided to pioneer a uh, a completely groundbreaking accelerator program where they take people from zero to hero, from zero to GRC associates, and it's a six month long incubator internship, and at the end of it, it's a paid internship, at the end of it you get a full time job as a, as a risk analyst working on one of our contracts. So my company's solution to not having enough technical folks to pull from, not having a big enough pool of hirees, was to create their own. And they are um, aiming the accelerator at people from uh, less advantaged backgrounds, so people who are teachers, janitors, uh, my own mother who's 62 is running for the accelerator right now. So they're trying to get as much diversity in as they possibly can. Aquia itself, for the small plug, is a service-disabled uh, service veteran owned small business. So all three of my founders are service-disabled veterans, and uh, they completely funded the company themselves, and the accelerator was their idea. I hope Matt gets here to speak more on the accelerator later. Currently she serves, um, again, GRC was where she graduated, the function she graduated in. She currently works on a zero trust team. And let me tell you, she works with some pretty heavy hitting engineers and she is the most knowledgeable in zero trust on that team. So it doesn't matter what your experience level is, you can make yourself the go-to expert for your team on any piece of subject matter that you choose. So the first thing we were gonna ask ourselves was why cyber? Why did you want to be here? What made you want to choose cyber as an industry, given that it is so hard, right? And they don't just hand out entry-level opportunities like candy. If you can't just say, hey, I want to work in cyber, people go, okay, we'll give you a chance, right? You have to fight for it. And it takes grit, and it's a hustle. And there are unemployed OSCPs out there who want to murder me when I tell them I became a pen tester with no credentials and no skills. Um, but for me, I was at a point in life where I was a very successful social media manager for Caesars Entertainment, so I worked for a very big entertainment brand, and I loved marketing, it's still my OG love, I was good at my job, but they brought me in basically to backfill my manager a month into the job for an entire month while she was in Thailand. So they were like, congratulations, you're hired, you're taking over the department a month. I was like, great, I can do that. They knew I could hit the ground running, that's what I do, it's one of my superpowers. So I did that, I ran the entire department, nothing burned down, everything was not great. She came back and then I was like, cool. I was like, well, I ran this whole department, now I'm going to go back to being the social media manager and the copy editor, and that's not enough for me anymore. And then I started looking ahead, because that's what I do. I like to look ahead and plan backwards. And I was like, do I want to be her? No. Do I want to be her boss? No. Do I want to be his boss, who is the CMO? And I was like, no. I don't want to do any of those things. Why am I still here? And I was like, you know what? I'm sick of hitting the knowledge ceiling. I'm sick. I tried a number of industries. If you've ever seen my blogs and my posts about it, I was a wedding planner. I was a technical recruiter. I worked in every industry you can possibly imagine. And every single time I got bored. 
So I picked cyber because my criteria were make a good salary because I was a single mother. At the time when I pivoted into cyber, I had an infant and a toddler. Uh, I wanted normal working hours, again, to spend time with my family, nine to five, have my weekends off. But mostly, I wanted really challenging work. I didn't want to ever sit back and be like, oh, I know all this now. There's nothing left to learn. It's cyber related. Uh, so I said I'm going to pick the most mercurial, difficult, nebulous sounding thing I possibly can, and that's what I'm going to do. And that's why I arrived at cyber. I was like, I'm going to do this until I suck at it or I hate it. Luckily, neither of those things happened. So I'm still here. Um, but that was literally why I picked it. Mackenzie picked it because she uh, happened to run into somebody who gave her the idea. They were like, why don't you try this? And she was like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. And they're like, guess what? I guess you can. Like, we're going to launch this accelerator program. It's meant for people with no experience. In fact, if you have two years of experience, you won't get accepted because that's already too much experience for people for this program. And so she'll tell you a really fun story about a few months she spent crying on the couch being fed up with athletics and wondering what she was going to do next. And she ended up picking the cyber because it was suggested to her, and she got inspired to try it. So how did I break in? The tail's oldest time question, the number one question I get the most. OK, that sounds great. You want to be here. You have the passion. How did you freaking do it? And I'm like, ah, yes. So for me, I, again, wanted to break into an industry where they don't let very many people in. And you have to rely on the strengths that you can buy. So whereas I knew they wouldn't let me into cyber, again, they don't give out entry-level positions like candy. They do give out mid-level management training like candy to 21-year-olds in the military. So I decided to lean on what I knew already. I already had previously been in the reserves, and I had gone through ROTC and graduated OTS. So I decided to enlist in the military. And again, and then I would leverage my knowledge there to work my way into a cyber unit. I would work the cyber unit title to get my way into private cyber, and that was going to be my path, and that's exactly what I did. So when I got into the guard, I, you know, didn't carry myself like everybody else. I didn't. I wasn't an 18 year old who was, you know, newly out of college or into college, and I wasn't afraid of everybody that I saw. And I didn't keep my head down and walk through the hallways as fast as possible. I spoke the lingo. I carried myself like them. I confidently walked up to every NCO, every flight commander, every low level officer I could get my hands on, and I value propped myself. I literally said, "What?" Like challenges you're gonna experience, oh, you know what? I've done that before. I've, I've done that. I can do that. I have that skill. Until so I had all these units fighting over me. Because when I enlisted, I said I want to be in cyber, right? That's my plan, getting cyber. Well, that's not open. Okay, uh, I will take Intel then. Okay, well, that's also not open. Okay, great. Uh, then it doesn't matter where you put me, I won't be in this job in six months. And she's like, that's not how it works. I'm like, that, mm, you don't know. You don't know. So you can tell she didn't know me very well. Um, so eventually I did have the cyber unit. Uh, telling them that I wasn't able to come in, even though I had no experience. And I said, listen, I know even in the military, you still prefer people to have a little bit of experience, haven't taken a coding class, haven't done something to justify their want to be in this very technical unit. I have none of that, I won't lie to you. But I learned really fast, I retained really well, I literally leveraged my ASVAB score, which was like a 98 at the time. So I was like, you know that I can come in and learn quickly and immediately apply what I learn. And you know, I was like, I'm in my 30s. I'm not one of these teens. Like, I want to be here. This is the unit that I choose. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I literally, I literally had to fight for what I wanted. And that's oftentimes what it takes to get your first chance in cyber. So I got into that unit, threw that up on LinkedIn. Five months went by. A recruiter reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, We think you'd be perfect for this GRC job. And I was like, Well, what are the qualifications? And she was like, Oh, what are you doing it now? Only has like a master's in cyber. It's not a big deal. I was like, Yeah, I don't have one of those. Um, that sounds like a lot. And um, she said, well, we really think you could do this. You, you work for the guard. You just cyber for the guard. I was like, no, 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 that's different. We drill two days a month, and I've been in the unit for five months. So I have less than two calendar weeks of cyber experience, if they let me touch anything, which they don't. So that's not the same. So I literally got this job by telling the recruiter that I was completely unqualified for the job. Because, uh, you know, I want to set that bar nice and low, and then over deliver. Um, but I did decide to talk to the woman I was backfilling, and I said, you know, what does your job entail every day? What do you actually do? And she told me she worked with these audit documents and found the discrepancies, reported on it to the team. They used that to determine whether or not they're going to onboard a vendor, uh, how much increases things like attack surface and risk surface, and I was learning all these words. And I was like, well, I could do that. Well, I could totally do that. Okay, no big deal. So I went into that interview, and I said, listen, I have not been to tech school. I have no cyber experience. I don't know what IP addresses are, but I learned quickly. I retain well. I can implement immediately. And to boot, I'm a public speaking, and I know a lot of you, 
in cyber do not. So I was like, I am willing to take on every single meeting, every single presentation, every single outreach. You teach me what it is you want to say, and I will say it to the people. And I just literally told them how I was going to take work off their plate and make their lives easier. Did I have a CH to do that? No. Did I have a master's in cyber to do that? No. Did I have any technical skills at all? No. So I gave myself a few things. I gave myself a strength that I had already that I could immediately give value to my team. You want to immediately provide value in whatever you're strong at. And I gave myself a nice big learning curve to ask the stupid questions, right? Be the stupid person in the room. Which was very, very crucial. I was like, I know if I ask this question but completely uneducated, everyone's already expecting that. So the only thing I can do is impress them or be what they're expecting already. And that healthy humility is so difficult. Right, because cyber we're expected to know it all. Like if I say the wrong quote, or I say the wrong protocol, or I say the wrong tool, everyone's gonna rip me to shreds. And I'm like, we need to go with that as an industry because I my 20 year architect would raise his hand in meetings and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Do that again, I'll do it better, or break it down differently. And I'm like, okay, if Bob doesn't know, then it's okay that I don't know, right? That's okay. Um, but that's physically how I did it. I again got myself a title in a unit where I knew I would be accepted. I threw that on LinkedIn. So my first formal and informal mentors came from there, and uh, and I literally my first opportunity came to me, and then I said no, 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 and they said yes, 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 and then here I am, four years of age. That's how I did it. So the challenges, right? God, it's so great. I'm gonna, I have to get up and walk. I have to. What are the challenges, right? It's so great that you want to be here. It's so great that you can not pop yourself. It's so great that you know your skills. But that doesn't make it easy, right? That doesn't mean it's easy to walk the path, especially once you get into the ore. Then you've got to start adding value and learning new things and proving yourself over and over and over. So I faced a number of challenges when I came into cyber. Despite the fact that I was confident in who I was, and I, this was not my first rodeo, right? I'm a tenured professional who's already built herself a successful career, just not a successful cyber career. So I faced a number of challenges. First of all, as a single mom, I had to attempt to learn my new industry, show up to my job every day, back when that was still a thing, and take care of my very, very, very young children. So I had a lot of those late nights, midnight nights, reading books on the weekends, reading books at dinner time, um, a lot of that. Additionally, I faced challenges as a millennial, which believe me at the time, no one wanted to deal with. So uh, then I faced the upskill challenge, right? I am a non-technical person working in a highly technical career, and I hope to advance in that career. And I've never attempted technical material before, so I don't know if this is going to go well or if this is going to go horribly bad, but we're going to find out together. Um, and then one of the other challenges was that uh, I started learning my job during the pandemic. I actually got promoted to being a pen tester a few months before everyone went remote overnight. So I had to now attempt to learn my job without being able to look over my coworkers' shoulders and attend meetings with them, do stand-ups and stuff like that. I had to learn how to do it digitally. Um, so there were a significant number of challenges for me personally. And even about you know six months a year into my journey, as I upskilled and I actually knew what I was talking about, I gained some expertise and I had a value added opinion, and I'm like, I know how my opinion affects the thing that we're talking about. Then, still, left and right, had my results second guessed, had my reports second guessed, had to defend myself in every meeting, every finding, every outbreak. Someone literally said, She just got here, what qualifies her to tell me what's wrong with my system? And I said, Well, if someone as unqualified as me can do it, then we should be really scared of the skilled people, shouldn't we then? So, the challenges keep coming, but it's those challenges that force us to push ourselves and be better so we can rise to meet them because the challenge isn't going away. It basically comes down to how bad do you want to overcome the challenge and how bad do you want to stick up for what you know is right and what you know that you're capable of. And that's what I constantly do. So what went well? If it was horrible and everyone hates on a millennial and I was putting all these midnights and I picked the most difficult thing I possibly could, what kept me coming back? Why? Why did I stick with cyber? Um, a few things did go well. First of all, bring it back to the pandemic. Everything went virtual. Literally everything. All of a sudden, you know, B-sides were going virtual and cons were spinning up left and right and all these experts were donating their time and they were very accessible and I no longer had to travel and leave my small children to go to cons to gain this knowledge. I could do it Saturday, folding laundry, playing with my kids, learn from people. They started making all these resources, putting all these toolkits together, putting together these repositories, um, and basically I was able to just start drinking from the fire hose. So I actually decided to become a cyber professional at a really, really, you know, I won't say this was a great time for the world, because it wasn't, but it was really a strategically intelligent time when the workforce went remote. Um, I was able to benefit from that, and I worked it to my benefit. I didn't just go, well, oh, remote, I lost all the learning resources, and I'll just give up. I was like, no, 
how I would take, I signed up for everything. I read every article, whatever I could get my hands on, that's what I did. Eventually, though, the pandemic ended, and we went back to in-person things, and I don't know if you've ever met me, but in person is kind of where I shine. So, the more people I met, the better I felt. And at first, people took an interest in me because I was that non-technical girl who, like, got your sent plus in two weeks, and like, what, you're a pen tester, and you didn't know what a command line was? Yes. Um, and so people took interest in me for that reason. They were like, oh, you're someone who just came out of nowhere and you're doing what we've been doing for years. That's awesome. Um, and, you know, one conversation led to another, led to a podcast, led to another podcast, and my brand grew, which was phenomenal, um, because I was just out there telling people the reality of it. I was like, if you're going to Google all this stuff and get all these results, all that stuff is bull. You don't need any of that. I'm not an expert in Python. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. I don't have one of these, but I do this job every day. Because this is the skills that the job demands, but if you can do skills, you're qualified to do the job. Um, and eventually, you know, about, about a year and a half into my journey, which is not a long time, it's a long time in Maryland years, um, people kept wanting to lean into that. Like, tell us your story. Like, we have this non-technical girl here, and I was like, excuse me, I was that non-technical girl at one point in time. Yes, that was me, I was the newbie. Um, but now I'm not. You know, now I've got some things under my belt. I'm in a master's program that I finished in six months. I'm like, I'm, I'm one of you. You know, I have a qualified opinion. I'm an expert, just like you. I have expertise. And I would like to start being known for my expertise in offensive things and in purple teaming, and not just as that completely new non-technical world, because I'm not her anymore. And my brand is working. <laughs> But there's a way to lean into your technical expertise and own the things that you're good at and own the value that you bring while giving a nod to who you used to be. But it's okay to evolve also. So how did I lean on my background to make all these things happen? Because, again, I wanted to be a cyber expert and I knew nothing about the cyber world. But I was a social media manager who knew everything about growing things on social media. So there are several aspects of my background that I personally leaned on to help my journey. First of all, I was a theater kid back in high school. So we got Mackenzie, this athletics coach, and I was a theater kid. And that was amazing because it helped me find my authentic voice. It helped me be comfortable standing up in front of people, which if you will recall, was one of the first skills that I offered up to my team. Um, and it also helped me understand when it's important to take the spotlight, but when it's important to lead from backstage, right? I worked in the, the trenches of customer service for years, y'all. Medical device customer service, not the nice kind. And that taught me how to build really quick, genuine rapport with people, get what I need from them, and then get out of their way. But it also taught me how to network and talk to people and deal with multiple motivations, and you're having a bad day, and I just need to get a single voice paid. And, you know. So I leaned on that because that is where my in-person networking skills came from. That's why I'm able to walk up and talk to absolutely anybody, find a commonality with you, and then we become friends. Additionally, capabilities-wise, again, no cyber capabilities at all, right? Literally, the first tool I ever tried to install, I'm looking at a Git wiki page, and it's something simple like you have to install Homebrew first. I'm like, okay, and it's like a wget command. And I'm like, double click on it, and nothing's happening, and nothing's downloading, and I'm like, is this broken? Uh, and I had to ask my friends for help, and they were like, don't get me wrong, we were, uh, we were worried for you in the beginning. You asked some really bad questions. <laughs> we didn't know if you were going to make it, but we're, but we're glad you did. Um, but I leaned on my social media skills. I knew how to grow visibility and grow a brand and engage with people on social media. And that is literally where all of my opportunities have come from. Not one single opportunity that I've ever had in cyber, from GRC to pen testing, to red teaming, to purple teaming, to being a senior architect, have I ever applied for. They all came to me. Because if no one's gonna give you the opportunity to demonstrate your skills, if your resume, I don't know if you know this about me, my resume, when I have submitted it, gets automatically denied. I've gotten denied for so many jobs I've applied for. But if you talk to me in person, you lean in a lot more. So your resume is not who you are. Resumes fall flat on people. Where you get to shine is when you get to talk. So, or when you get to like introduce yourself to people. So I leaned on that hard. I said, like, no one's gonna give me a platform to show what I know, but I'm just gonna use my own. I'm just gonna start showing it, whether or not you wanna read. If you wanna read and come along, great. And if you don't, then fine. This part of my journey is not for you. So I leaned on my theater kid training, my customer service training, my social media training, and I've been on the military knowledge I already had, right? Knowing that board, knowing that playing field, I always say, if you show up to a fair fight, you prepare well enough. I always give myself the unfair advantage. If I can OSINT a manager who's given a webinar to shine in his interview, I do it. 
If I can learn something about you that most candidates don't know and use that to my benefit, I do it. That is how you leverage your strengths and what you've got to stand out. So Mackenzie didn't get to talk about any of the aspects of her journey. Unfortunately, again, we will see if we can special record this webinar the way it was meant to be delivered so you guys can get two different points of view, which was the whole point of the talk. Um, but even though she came from an athletics background and she got to join an accelerator and she was basically gifted a job right after, kind of like the military, right? She joined, went to boot camp. After boot camp, she was given a, a job in a unit and she just does her job now. Um, I didn't have that. I had to, you know, pivot and scrap my way in a variety of different ways, right? But our journeys did have some commonalities. The first one, power of soft skills. Confidently ask questions and learn. That healthy humility. So many cyber professionals are completely unwilling to admit they don't know something to their own detriment. If you have to give yourself a learning curve, a nice low ceiling of expectation, do it. If you need to get yourself an extra friend doesn't care if they look like an idiot, do it. You know how many people are like, Ask like, yeah, I have a question. I don't understand what you do. And no one questions me because I've been here for a number of years. I'm the senior, right? No one's going to say, really? You don't know what I just said? They're just going to go, right, right. Let me, let me explain that for you again. So get yourself someone you trust in meetings. Get yourself someone you can sidebar with on a webinar. Um, willingness to work diligently to upskill. You have to put in the hustle at least at first. If you're completely new and you're breaking in, it's going to be a hustle. You're not going to sign up for one boot camp, do it over a weekend, and go get a job. It's just not how it works. You have to find your creative ways to get in. You have to be willing to do the work nobody else wants to do. Do you think anyone else wanted to go through the soft documents and wanted to write reports and wanted to maintain documentation? No, that's why I was like, I'll do it. That's a great place to learn. Spending time with all that documentation is one of the best ways to learn, to learn the tiny nuances of your job and get a really good slow exposure. Um, I really shouldn't be thinking about that. That's how I have to speak with my hands. Um, additionally, the more, the more you're going to take on the work of one once again, Mackenzie works on a zero trust team. And she was the only one who decided to take the unglamorous work on and become an expert in what zero trust actually is, how you actually implement it. Um, and now she's just me on the team over all of the tenure seniors. Um, being a mother and a coach. That's a freaking skill. You don't think being a coach, being a mom is a skill. You have to manage timelines and budgets for multiple different people. You have to get them all like to believe in a common goal that they don't want to believe in. You have to get them to eat things they don't want to eat. That takes some social engineering, let me tell you. So the ability to multitask, manage your time and energy, and discipline yourself um, was a skill that I brought with me that I value prop to myself with. Finally, we have Google Clean and Social Clean. So whatever communicator you are, whatever your strength is, if it's writing, if it's speaking, if it's Googling, if it's research, research is a full-time job, by the way. Um, Whatever it is, find your clean skill and embrace that. I was a social queen, right? So I leveraged the crap out of that. Mackenzie was a Google queen. She didn't just Google, like, how do I get into cybersecurity? She Googled, how do I read a stick report, and then how do I implement these things, and how do I articulate that back to people? That is a practical skill that she implemented almost immediately. That is very intelligent and creative Googling. So identify a skill that you have and lean on it hard. Transferability. Again, I had no cyber skills. But I learn really, really easily. I learn damn fast. It's my superpower. And I can turn around and implement those things immediately. I'm not someone who can only do a capture the flag in a capture the flag environment. I can manipulate it to apply to many environments, which is a skill. Um, love of public speaking. It speaks for itself. Um, again, a lot of people don't like talking about their work. I have so many friends who develop tools and come to me and like, what do you think about something? This is cool. You should talk about it. Why do you want to talk about it? You talk about it. Like, it's your work, you should talk about it. A lot of people just can't. So if that's something that you love, you can find something you love that you're good at that other people hate. Mine was public speaking. And that was so great for me initially because my face became the face of cyber for everybody. I was attending the meetings. My name and face were up on all those slides. All the higher ups and business managers got to know me and know that if they needed something from her or Heather or Bob, they had to come to me first. That is excellent branding, in case you weren't aware. Tenacious approach. I am an overly tenacious individual. I see something I want and I relentlessly pursue it. It does not serve me in all capacities. There are some environments where my tenacity does not serve me, but more often than not, it has. It's also who I authentically am. So I don't ever want to pigeonhole myself into a job where that's not going to be embraced because then I don't need to live my true self and I become very stunted. For Mackenzie, but we still have these things in, in so these are Mackenzie's. Loss is opportunity. Someone tells you no, your application gets rejected, you you suffer a loss in the game. Do you know what single sports team who lost the game and went, oh, we'll just quit the NFL now, I guess, because we suck? No. 
They go back and they say, where did we mess up? Where can we do better? Where can we tighten that up? How do we make it better next time? They evaluate themselves, right? Losses are opportunities for improvement. That is your, there is proof in the negative. That is your barometer. That is your gap analysis to figure out what to, what to improve on and how to apply it. Competitor mindset. You love it. Being here is like being a pop singer, man. It's not enough to write one, one hit. You want to stay here, you've got to keep pumping them out. You want to be here, you have to want it. You have to want it really bad. You have to show you want it. You have to, you have to educate people on how much you know and how much you've learned and how much you believe and how much you want for people to understand. It takes a competitor mindset. If you sit in the back and hope that good things will happen to you, they will not happen to you. I have the level of success that I have today. And people say, wow, you're so lucky. You're so lucky all that worked out. I'm like, I'm not lucky. I'm smart. I engineered this to be this way. This was according to my design. So it takes a competitor mindset. Strength of females. I don't know if you know this, but sports the male-dominated industry. Cyber is a male-dominated industry. Most of the industries out there are male-dominated industries, and I love, I love all the gentlemen I've worked for. They've all been phenomenal individuals. But it takes a strong network of females. It takes those of us who have come before to help those of us who come after. If you're one of the ones who is an example of success, who has risen above, who has overcome certain challenges, it's up to us to make it faster, better, easier for those who come after. We need to stop the toxic competition between us because we're either all going to succeed in, in like not being rich together or we're all going to go down together. But we are happy to help bring each other along and we all should be as one. Just because you toil doesn't mean other people have to toil just as hard. That's my message to you. Mentality. So when I came in, I had a clear idea of what success looked like. I knew exactly what I wanted. This wasn't my, again, my first career that I had ever built, right? I was like, I don't know how to climb the ladder and show my skills and get a promotion. I was like, I want that promotion in three months. I'm working for that today. And when three months came along, I was prepared for it. I was like, I want that opportunity next. I literally sat back and said, who are the best pen testers in the world? And I modeled my career after those people. And I started studying what they studied and doing what they did and targeting positions that sounded like the ones they had. And I was like, I'm just going to replicate your freaking career my own way. And I know that if I follow these steps, I will have success. So I had a clear idea of what success looked like for me. When I got into risk, I knew exactly how I would get out of risk. And so on and so forth. Knowing where we wanted to go, just touch on that. Unique perspectives. People ask, okay, we know you're working for the board, you're already working for, we know you're working for risk, but what told them you would be a great pen tester? With again, I haven't even held us in my life, you guys. You wouldn't even believe it. What made them believe you'd be a good pen tester? And they asked me one question that I asked them over everybody else. They said, your neighbor has a safe in his basement. It's your job to break into the safe. Tell me your plan. How do you get to the safe? I guess a lot of people were like, oh, I go in through a side window, or I test the doorknob, or whatever. I was like, I have some questions. They're like, OK. I was like, are you like my knowledge base? They're like, yes. I was like, OK. How many doors? How many windows? How many stories? Do they have kids? Do they have dogs? Do they bark? Do they work full-time jobs? Do they work remote jobs? Do they work from home? What hours are they typically gone? Do they have neighbors? How close are the neighbors? Like, do they have an ABT sign in their front yard? Like, I had all these questions. Before I could formulate the plan, I had to know the parameters, right? That's just how my brain works. And they're like, that is what told us that you have the hunter mindset, that you have the right mindset. You can teach people the hard skills. You can learn how to fax. You can learn how to use tools. You can learn all these things, but you can't learn that need to uncover every single rock and check every dot on a 10 file for an admin hatch. And sometimes there are hundreds. So that is one of the things that told them that I would be good at this job and I could learn the technical bits later. They already knew that. Power of women. That was actually Mackenzie's point to speak to. Um, she did not go the social media route. She built a very strong internal brand to the corporate network. She has a very, very small network, but it's mighty. I'm one of the people in her network, and so uh, we're here together today because she's one of my mentees that I originally started to mentor. Uh, in fact, back when I met her, <laughs> uh, one of the first offsites for Aquia, I was like, oh my god, the new businesses are here, I'm so excited. And I started bombarding her with questions like, where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And she looked at me like, I had a form coming out of my head. She didn't even know what that meant. She didn't even know what she didn't know. So uh, I realized she was literally just like me. She literally was me four years ago. Um, and now look at her. She's, she's up right up there with me, you know prowess and expertise wise. So it takes the power of people being able to teach you and bring you along. And I set up Q&As with people in different verticals and I exposed her and I let her figure out where her strengths lie and what kind of career in cyber she wanted to pursue. And then I made all the introductions. I was like, here, you can benefit from my network. Go ahead. Um, and that's the power of women to help other women get. So our takeaways. For me, personal branding, 
networking on LinkedIn, targeted learning. My personal brand has always, always served me. It's not the only route, it's the route that I know best. So if you want strategies on that, then I'm going to be your girl. Again, every opportunity I've ever gotten comes from my networking on LinkedIn. Uh, in fact, sometimes I tag people and they just get a DDoS of connection requests from me. I call it a DDoS of love. <laughs> um, targeted learning. When I knew I didn't know where I wanted to go, but I knew where, where I wanted to be, I started targeting specific skills. No one wants to learn cloud, I'll learn cloud. I'll be the go-to cloud expert. I will offer a benchmark in cloud security, and I did that. Someone questioned me once. They were like, you don't have any cloud experience. I was like, oh yeah. Who wrote the book? Did you write the book? Okay. Um, so targeted learning. I targeted my skills very intelligently, and I applied them immediately. ROI to the job first, then learn a passion thing. Then learn a thing that you want to learn. If you're not providing value to your job, if you're so focused on the next job that you're not learning and maximizing your job now, why would they trust you with the next thing if you can't master this thing? I don't care what that thing is. If that is an unglamorous thing, if it's report writing, if it's research, if it's being the meeting sacrificial lamb, you be the best meeting sacrificial lamb they have ever freaking seen. You master it, automate it, you can take 10% of your time, and then they'll give you something else. That's what I did. Mackenzie's takeaways were to be humble, but don't take any crap. So it takes a healthy humility, like I said, but also know where you stand. Know where your expertise does stand, and when people question you, question them right back. We have to take up space as women. We have to speak up for ourselves because no one else is going to do it for us. They would, if someone says a rude comment to you in a meeting, like someone called me the boppy millennial chick in security, no, right? As if I'm not boppy. Um, oh my gosh! Well, I don't have a degree, 
I didn't build a computer when I was nine. No. I don't have five years of work experience. No. So I can't be an associate, associate entry level SOC analyst or whatever. No. And you don't need that. You know, shoot your shot, bet on yourselves, and I think it's pretty awesome what you can do if you do that. We only have two slides left after this. So I told them my pieces, but if, do you want to do your before slides? Again, you've got a bit of time. Which time is that? Um, so I was about 38, but jettisoned my watch. Oh, no, it's too heavy. I had to cut all the way to get here on time. I ran through a construction zone. It's about 42. It's intense. It's hot. Same cool to Mario. It's hot outside, guys. Yeah, it's hot. Um, <laughs> and I gave you the quick rundown. I think the hardest thing for me coming into this space, and I, do we have any new cyber entry people? So well, we're we're in the first in. couple years. Yeah, who, who was, this wasn't your first career? So that imposter syndrome is like crippling at times. I think in this industry that is so data rich, it's so acronym rich, like, what's an ISO? You know, like, what's an SBOM? These were the things that kept me up at night when I was super, super new, and they make it hard to get in. Um, I think for me, the most important thing, and Mira probably touched on this, is that I knew I was bringing in soft skills from my background. You know, I spent 13 years coaching NCAA athletics, managing big budgets, mercurial people, my whole livelihood been hinged on the performance of like 20 year old people. Yeah. It's scary. <laughs> That's well, an ulcer waiting to happen. One of the best stories Mackenzie's got though is how when she first came here, she became, she kind of lost herself in the soft a little bit, right? She wanted to prove that she was a leader. Thank you for taking the chance on me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm gonna work so hard. I was like, don't do that. She was like, why? I was like, because that will become your minimum standard. You don't have to work extra hard to prove you deserve to be here. They believed in you when they gave you the job. Just do your job, just be good at your job, and don't do more. Like, sometimes you do contribute extra, yes, but like, don't overwork yourself. Don't work yourself into the same pattern you've had before, where you're taking on the workload of like four people just to qualify for your right. job. And that's such a huge part about owning your space as well, it's defending the work-life balance. A huge reason why initially this industry was really attractive to me is it put a huge premium on innovation and constant upskilling and creativity but also on owning some space, having that work-life balance. One of my favorite things about the leadership of that organization and their own network work is they say, well, if you're working 60 hours a week, that's part-time for another person. Don't do that. Yeah. You're only getting paid for 40 hours a week. Do 40 hours of exceptional work, but then close your laptop, well, turn it off. And that doesn't exist in some industries. And there are periods yeah. when you're breaking in where you gotta grind a little bit. But I think we all tend to not turn the grind off enough because you can only pour out of a cup that's got something in it. Yeah, you've got to refill that cup occasionally. But once she realized she was lost, she was like, oh yeah, I came into this with something already. I came in with prowess. I came in with capabilities. And I'm still going to apply those to my job so that I'm providing value, but it takes like, it only takes like 30% of her effort, which is already good at these things. Then she can spend the other 70% on that upskilling that she needed to do. Totally. So again, we're, we're so sorry you need to hear more of Mackenzie's story. I, didn't, I wouldn't have done it justice. So I didn't want to talk about it too much. But we'll probably do a special recording. But we are at the 45-minute marker. So I guess the only thing we wanted you to take away was that no matter what skills you have, no matter what you bring today, well, hi, hi don't give me a button. There is a place for you in cyber. There's a place for you in cyber. So go find it. So go find it and dominate your space. <laughs> Y'all, I've been texting Miro from the Delta Airlines, like, who loves that new Wi-Fi? It's great, right? <laughs> and uh, it's been like, so, how's it going? We're getting in at 948. Uh -huh. I was like, that's cool, that's cool. It's going to be awesome. Cool, 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 cool. So we didn't get to go into my slides as much, but we wanted to hold a little bit of time for questions. I know we've got some recent cyber pivoters in here. I was going to ask questions about applying stuff to your backgrounds. Does anyone have any questions you can answer? Former athletics coach, former veteran social media skills. Actively just came through a six month accelerator program going from non technical. My husband's standing in the back. He's amazing. I threw my back to him like a mile ago. I was like, hopefully well, you make it. Um, and he did all of our tech stuff. And in six months, I'm working as a zero trust architect. You know, defense in depth. So, that's really cool. Any questions about pivots or anything like that? Can answer? Yeah. Hey, let's go. I was on I gave my bachelor's in biology in December. Awesome. I'm in science. I'm just wondering if there's a way to apply cybersecurity to the healthcare system or to biology. Or yeah. Well, oh, you mean you mean how does cyber apply to healthcare? Something like that. <laughs> uh, 
when you sign into your patient portal, where does that go? When you've got all your labs and all your stuff there, who's watching it for you? I mean, specifically, there's a ton of crossover in those industries. Think like Epic, that where you were like in the medical field, the yeah. human medical field, we're storing all those files. Are you asking about that? Or are you or asking channel, about like, skills? A way to merge, like bio? Everything is Everything. I mean, the answer is yes, everything, because this is like the universe. Cybersecurity is actively expanding. Yeah, you've got strong analytical skills. You know the scientific method. You know how to formulate an idea, a hypothesis, test it, document it, and brief other people on it, right? I hypothesize that our firewall is vulnerable. Oh yeah, go prove it. I will go prove it, and I'll give you an outbreak. So you have analytical, transferable skills already, no, literally no matter where you come from. Um, and if you need help with more of that skill identification and crossover, please hit one of us up after. Yeah. Actually, one of the things that we talked about when we were playing this job was how both of us starting as working adults in not in cybersecurity in a different industry really gave us a different perspective on the space. There's something to be said for being that like blue-blooded, took a college or a computer side course in college and has been in the space forever. But there's also something to be said for coming in and not being so close to like the pedagogies of cybersecurity that you can't see other alternatives. Big picture security. Yeah. I think your background in medicine can be a really cool way to pivot and then think about the space differently. Right here. Um, what do you look for in an, an accelerated program? How do you find something reliable? Because I keep getting ads for things like boot camps, like you want, Amy, and I will get you in. And they're predatory. Right. They're designed to make money, and maybe you get a job, but there's so many of them now. So here's what you should look for. You should look for a consistent time, time uh, commitment from the court. It should be paid. They should uh, supply consistent mentoring during the apprenticeship and afterwards, like women like this, and there should be, at least if you perform well, the idea that there's going to be a job offer, offer afterwards. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes money. That's the only way we're going to get to close this hundreds of thousands of open jobs in cyber if we dedicate those resources to getting that. Now, small disclaimer, an accelerator will be different than a boot camp. An accelerator should take place over a number of weeks. Like, it takes time to six months to get yourself and affiliate yourself with this material and again get feedback on how well you're comprehending. A boot camp is going to be a highly concentrated I mean, who here has attended the same course. And there are good boot camps so, out there. There are good boot camps. Be careful. Just know what to look for. Yeah. I think I saw Andrew here too. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering what resources you found to be the most helpful from a foundational perspective. So, you know, as I also a quick learner coming from like a related, but now my focus area is going to be cyber, I'm learning a lot of it as things are coming up. But what have you found that's been most useful to help develop that common cyber lexicon and do it accessibly because a lot of those really good, like one week courses are very, very expensive and take you away from your 40 hour, you know, nine to five. I would say understand your environment and what your environment needs. Like, um, I want to take a course that looked really freaking cool and had a ton of cool stuff in it, all AD, Active Directory related. And I worked for an org at the time that was mostly Mac OS endpoints, and we had absolutely no use for that whatsoever. We didn't do any AD provisioning at all. So they're like, well, that sounds great. You know, you would love to take it. That's not going to provide the organ benefit. I'm like, you're right. I should learn something Mac affiliated. I should learn something with what we currently work with. Um, because, you know, you're, you can't learn. You can't just learn Windows and Linux and all these things at the same time. you got to start somewhere. So start with what will apply to your job. Like, and I was like, fine, I'll go learn everything about the cloud, absolutely everything. So for me, starting with AWS made the most sense because then I became a go-to AWS person. Um, you know, was I then on the outside? No, but I was then on the inside, which was powerful for my team. Um, so look at what your org needs, look at where your org is going next, and say, I'll pick that thing and become the expert in that thing. Um, and that's how where you can start. And then you can see where those things branch off to other things and touch other things. And then you're kind of building on your foundational knowledge already. You're not just trying to learn six different things cold. That would be my advice. Are you currently in cybersecurity now? Yeah, I okay. have been for about a year. Okay, nice. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Probably yes. Yeah, I've been over a year, but just like building that foundational lexicon from a non technical background. Yes. There you go. I see it. Awesome. There are some great free resources from LinkedIn Learning. They're awesome. They're pretty foundational. I know we've got some peers from Cobalt here. One of their co workers, Caroline Wong, cranks out some amazing stuff that you can get for free. And then one thing that's really helped me, and this is something that Meryl and I have talked about as well, find one of those entry-level certs, the uh, the uh, ISC Square Certified Cyber CC, Security, yeah, Certified Cyber Security, CompTIA Security Plus is maybe a little bit more advanced, but you, you've been in for a bit. Those are go-at-your-own-pace certs that, that really helped us kind of like 
cement some of that terminology in the framework someplace, and, and then you come out of it with a certification as well, which is going to set you up for success. And they're not crazy expensive because they're designed to be. Yeah, yeah, and if you want some specific recommendations, please come find me out. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Grant, you're on the front. How do you. Uh, By the way, Andy Grant was my former manager. How do you identify and approach a potential mentor? How do you identify and approach a I was pretty relentless. I linked in them, I bothered them a lot. Um, Meryl's great because she's a big practitioner of lateral and backwards men of like mentorship and networking, so she has always been really open. She's a perfect mentor. Um, but I would say just most people are really excited to have peers and to have conversations. It doesn't have to be just like, what can I take from this person? I really like kind of service menteeship where you're like, okay, this is my mentor, but how can I help them? Yeah. What is the earliest I can value add to what they're doing? A lot of people are going to be really open to that kind of relationship. So as someone who's had a lot of mentors um, and mentored myself, and a mentee, I look for a specific goal. Are you trying to get a promotion? Are you trying to get out of a rut? Are you trying to break in the cyber? Are you trying to figure out where to upskill? What is the specific thing I can help you learn? Because mentors can only help you benefit from their experience. We can't walk the walk for you, right? So if they're like, I just need a, a LinkedIn makeover or whatever, then fine. Um, as a mentee seeking a mentor, I go to them for a specific objective. I say, you made the leap from mid to senior. How did you do that? What did you study? How did you apply it? You made the leap from senior to low level manager. How did you get into junior management? What did that look like? What did you read? Who did you study? Um, so I always come to them with a specific objective and say, this is what I want your help on. This is how much time I need from you. Get in front of your face, ask you a question, and leave. You know, so I always value prop myself as a mentee to that also. Do your homework. Do your homework, yeah. Don't just say, help me break the cyber. I can't help you. <laughs> Dear, it's way too big. <laughs> um, all right, well, we are at time. They're kicking us off. So with that, it was so lovely to have you all. Thank you so much.